Good morning, everyone. My name is Jody Brooks, and I am your moderator for today. Um, I am the owner of JB Creative, a firm that specializes in event planning and strategic communications, and we're thrilled to have you here today. Um, this is day three, where in this learning session, you'll hear about how grain quality can impact safety. So just a couple of announcements before we get kicked off today. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please feel free to drop an email to ghscpromotions at gmail.com. Again, that's ghscpromotions at gmail.com. If you have any technical issues, and we're happy to help you out with those if we can. These learning sessions are brought to you by Grain Handling Safety Council with the assistance of an OSHA Harwood grant and the generous support of our sponsors who are Bartlett Grain, Central State Center for Agricultural Health and Safety, CoBank, Control Stuff Inc., and the National Grain and Feed Association Foundation. Thank you uh, to our generous sponsors for supporting this event. This session will be recorded and available at standupforgrainsafety.org, and that's four as in the number four. So check out standupforgrainsafety.org for lots of other great resources and the recordings after, uh, after this week. You will receive a certificate from the Grain Handling Safety Council for participating in this learning session. So if you participated in any of the other learning sessions, Tuesday through Friday, um, we will email you those from Grain Handling Safety Council. You can also get a stand-up participation certificate if you go to that website, standupforgrainsafety.org. Click on the recognize your participation at the top of the page, and then you can complete your own, um, you can insert your own name or the names of your employees just to show that you participated this week. Due to the number of people viewing this event, you've noticed your video and sound will be off, but um, we would like to continue the conversation. So if you can um, drop your comments or uh, questions in the chat box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen, we would love to do that. And I'm, I'm seeing my sound is coming in and out, so I'll do my best. I might have to switch my camera off, but Hopefully you guys um, can still hear me okay. So uh, throughout this event, we will have a series of polls that are very important for you to um, participate in. As we mentioned, those help us with our grant requirements. So thank you uh, for completing those polls. To show you how it works, let's go ahead and get started with a couple of poll questions. You'll see these coming up on your screen now. Tell us how many people are watching together right now? Is it just you or are you watching with uh, a group? Please click the appropriate response and also tell us what you know about grain quality and duration. So I'm seeing we're getting a couple of results. We'll leave this up for a few seconds as we complete these. Again, thank you so much for your participation in these. These help with our OSHA Harwood grant so we can continue to bring you quality education like this and other learning sessions. All right, well, let's go ahead and we'll um, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Salah Issa, who is an assistant professor of agricultural safety and health at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He is the project director for the OSHA Harwood grant supporting this program and other training programs conducted by Grain Handling Safety Council. All right, well, welcome Dr. Issa. Thank you very much, Jody. Good morning, everybody. Share our screens. Well, today I'm just gonna give a quick intro to the trends that we're seeing in grain storage to in a sense uh, build on the or help uh, demonstrate the presentations that we're doing later on today. Okay, so that's, uh, I'm at the University of Illinois. You can contact me at salah01 at illinois.edu. And uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Just as a disclaimer, 
uh, the, uh, this presentation as well as the presentations that we've been presenting from Tuesday to Friday. They have been produced under an OSHA Harwood grant. And it's, uh, it's important to note that the views expressed in these presentations do not reflect the views or the policies of the US Department of Labor, nor does any mention of trade names, commercial products, or organizations imply endorsement by the US government. Also, it's important to note employer rights. Uh, I mean, employee rights. Employees are entitled to safe and healthy working conditions, fair compensation, and then uh, they, they're entitled to report any unsafe conditions without retaliation. They can call, write, or email OSHA uh, within 30 days to report uh, uh, a retaliation. And as a, as a reminder, for uh, employers are responsible for providing a safe and working place. Okay, so uh, these are just general trends uh, that we, we've been seeing over the last uh, 30, 40 de decades. Our grain bins are getting larger, uh, more volume is being moved, we're filling, our, our, we're filling more, we're increasing the speeds that we fill our grain storage uh, bins at. Also, similarly, we're inc increasing the unloading speeds. Uh, we're seeing more grain storage capacity in the US, especially also on, on farms as well. And, and these trends have been continuing really uh, through the last 30 years. So corn production has been up uh, from 1994 to 2014 by 40%. On-farm uh, on storage is up by 11%. Off-farm storage is up by 24%. Our bin sizes from the 60s to now have uh, increased by over 133%. And uh, from the early 2000s to now, uh, we see our entrapments have increased uh, by about 60 uh, something percent. And currently in the US, about two thirds of all uh, storage uh, capacity is on farms. And, and this inform, uh, this these growth that, that the growth in everything is what is why it's such a big hazard that we're seeing in um, in, in both on farms and off farms. So uh, this data is uh, based on uh, the Paxit database from Purdue University. And if you look from early 2000s, we used to have about 18, 19 cases. And that has slowly grown to what we're seeing about 20 to 40 cases per year. So last year in 2019, we had uh, 38 cases. And what we, what we tend to see is that our cases, there, there appears to be a correlation with uh, basically wet and late harvests. So years that news reported that these were wet and late harvests, we see basically that's where our peaks are when it comes to grain entrapments. But it's, it's important also to know that overall, our trends have been consistent since at least basically 2004, 2005. We have every single year we've experienced between 20 to 40 cases with the exception of 21, I mean, 2010, where we saw almost 60 cases. And uh, in 2019, that's the latest data available in the Paxid uh, database. Uh, we saw 27% increase in entrapment over 2018. And we're, exp and we're expecting similar numbers in 2020, uh, but, we're, uh, but we'll, we'll find out probably later in May. Fatality rates for 2019 was 61%. This is higher on average. Usually we see about 50% uh, fatality rates, which is pretty significant still. And this, uh, this year in 2019, 77% of all incidents involved commercial facilities. And uh, what we see, the trends that we see is that basically we've, we've seen it vary We've seen it vary where from all the way to commercial facilities representing one third of the cases all the way to two thirds of the cases. And it, it, can, it tends to shift uh, year by year. Um, and historically, it's been mostly on farms, uh, but that's, uh, that's what we've been seeing the trends. It, it kind of shifts year by year uh, where the majority of these cases are. 
And yes, 23% are in farms. And, and do we expect the entrapment incidents continue to be a major? Uh, uh, we expect uh, entrapment incidents to continue to be a major concern on, uh, on, our, on our facilities as we continue to grow and, and also as you know, our, our weather is changing and we're experiencing, uh, we're experiencing warmer winters and, and different uh, conditions that actually make these worse. And in terms of how do we calculate the fatality rate, this is just, uh, just, this is just basically the number of incidents. So the number of incidents that we documented, how many were fatal, how many were unfatal, uh, how many they survived. And one of the major things that we see in our data, why these uh, grain entrapments uh, occur, is really due to bad grain. Uh, so we see whether the farmer goes in to clear uh, the sub pump and uh, the sump auger, and that's why he gets entrapped, whether it's a, there's a crust uh, that builds over the, the grain mass that the farmer is not aware of and he falls in it, or that there is, uh, basically a, a side build, sidewall buildup of, of grain that the farmer tries to tackle from below. So these are all different conditions that are all uh, types of entrapments, all caused by bad grain. And, and this is why we focused uh, this presentation on uh, grain quality. So we have two excellent speakers. One will talk about how to maintain the quality of your grain, and we're gonna follow, follow it with, well, you lost control, you have bad quality grain, how do you go about and making sure that you, do, uh, that you don't end up a uh, statistic? So I'll, I'll start with, uh, with introducing our first uh, speaker, Dr. K uh, Kent Rock, uh, Roche. He is a colleague of mine here at University of Illinois. He's an associate professor in ag and biological engineering. He conducts research related to grain processing and he's, uh, he teaches uh, courses on uh, fundamentals of heat, mass, and momentum transfer, grain processing, grain dry drying, and uh, storage systems. And I'll thank you there. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Everybody see my screen okay? Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate this opportunity. Um, so, uh, like Sala mentioned, uh, I'm going to try to link uh, things we do in uh, um, drying, storing grain to the ultimate in uh, controlling safety or improving safety of, of stored grain. Uh, and that involves a lot of topics uh, that I hope to cover uh, sufficiently well. Uh, to introduce you to what to be thinking about as you manage your, your storage system. So by the end, I hope you can understand these factors, uh, uh, maybe make a checklist in your mind, um, and identify the ones that uh, are in our control. Not all of them are in our control, such as the climate or weather. Uh, and then understand the relationship between grain quality, aeration, and even, and even safety. So as you probably know, there's a series of events that happen uh, as we harvest, dry, and store grain. And a couple of those steps involve this aeration that I'll get into later, later in my talk. Uh, sometimes we apply aeration while we're holding the, the wet grain before it's dry, but most of what I'm going to be talking about is the aeration used in these storage bins after the grain has gone through drying and has moved to its... Uh, it's a storage location. Um, first thing is, is to recognize that there are things that we can do um, to maintain quality uh, before we do the harvest, before we do the drying and play, put the grain in the bin. Um, and prevention is a very powerful thing. Uh, number one, obviously prevention, preventative measures have a very big effect on the quality or maintaining quality of the stored grain, but they're also powerful in the sense that they don't really cost much as far as equipment goes. It's just uh, planning and uh, some time to, to get done uh, well in advance of the harvest season. 
the, the, the sad fact, I consider it a sad fact anyway, is, that, is the realization that the quality that we have when we put the grain in the bin is the best that this grain is ever going to be. And so you can maintain the grain quality, but you're not going to be able to improve the quality as it sits in the bin. So you want to do everything you possibly can in advance as the grain is being placed in the bin uh, to have the highest quality possible uh, and then maintain it. Uh, this, this means controlling moisture temperature and uh, indirectly you'll, you'll control uh, biological activity. There are several factors uh, that we, we're going to look at. Uh, moisture content, grain temperature, the initial grain quality as it goes into the bin, uh, broken broken corn, bro broken grain and foreign material, fine material, and then the uh, biological activities such as insects, molds, and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> the first thing we want to talk about is preventing problems before they, they happen. Uh, first step, uh, the most proactive step is cleaning the bins before harvest. Uh, then when it does come time to uh, uh, dry harvest and dry we want to dry the grain properly uh, keeping in mind that a lot of the moisture contents and a lot of the guidelines that we have are maximum uh, moisture levels not averages um, the moisture content is going to vary by our crop type so you have different targets depending on whether it's corn soybeans wheat rice whatever um, of course we want to avoid over drying uh, because that can be another economic headache later on but uh, generally speaking um, no matter the economic conditions if you have drier grain you have more time available to you to uh, decide when you want to market the grain um, and if you have a, an issue with quality let's say it's a wet harvest where uh, just the, the drying operation just uh, had difficulty um, in control, even moisture, all sorts of issues can happen. Um, you want to try and dry things down to a lower moisture, which will, will give you more time also to figure out uh, how you want to market this grain. Uh, and then uh, there's also the, the grain temperature uh, issue. Uh, aeration is how we, will, we, we should do that. Uh, you want to turn grain as a last, very last resort. Uh, so lower temperatures uh, prevent problems because molds and insects and moisture migration is slowed down with lower temperatures. Uh, we can do whatever we can to, to mix or manage our fines. Uh, that, that goes all the way back to dryer control um, as well as how the, the bin is or how the grain is placed in the bin. Uh, insecticides if absolutely necessary and then a very inexpensive straightforward thing to do is to check the grain regularly to keep an eye on you know how the storage season is progressing so there are things that are directly under control of the managers um, if the grain is placed in the bin and it's very warm that needs to be corrected right away if the grain is um, too wet uh, the dryer needs to be operation needs to be uh, changed uh, because Placing grain wet in a, in a storage bin uh, just means you're going to have to take the grain back out again. And if you're going to redry it, that's very costly and damaging to the grain, or you're going to sell it at a discount. Uh, so those are things you want to avoid at all cost. Um, uneven grain temperatures can be controlled with aeration fans and aeration practices. Uh, we want to avoid, try to avoid high levels of foreign material and fines if we possibly can. Uh, cleaning the facilities before the harvest is a good idea, and then checking regularly uh, as the season progresses. So just some preventative uh, uh, guidelines here. Um, uh, way before harvest season really cranks up, uh, when you have time available, uh, is to inspect the physical structure of the grain, grain, uh, grain facility. So just making sure that the bin, the bin roof, the vents, don't leak is a very simple thing uh, to, to check for uh, because you can have uh, high quality grain ruined very quickly if uh, during the, the fall rains, uh, spring rains, uh, the bins leak and that, that just undoes everything that was done during the harvest and storage. Um, another thing that uh, avoids a lot of issues uh, proactively is cleaning out the bins, not leaving uh, 
old grain sitting in the corner of, of a cleaned out bin or an emptied bin. Um, this avoids inoculating the bin with insects, uh, obviously rodents as well, but also mold. And so you can just reduce the levels of contamination prior to placing grain in the bin. Obviously you can't, can't uh, rectify this after the, the bin is half full because typically the, the, the bad grain or the old uh, residual is in, is in the, underneath the floor or in, at, at the floor. Uh, one thing people may not realize is, is that the, the insect problems you may be fighting uh, generally are uh, growing at your facility. Uh, they don't come uh, from miles away, fly in and, and attack your grain. They're, they are there uh, uh, as part of your, your facility's ecosystem. So if you clean out the bins thoroughly, you've reduced greatly uh, the, the the level of insects and larvae that uh, can, can begin to grow in the grain. Uh, mold spores are with us all the time, but if you reduce uh, the, that you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds of grain in the corner of a bin, you reduce the, the starting levels of molds. Okay, so uh, moving on to the drying operation, this has many, many things that, uh, as everybody that's involved with harvest and drying knows, it's a pretty hectic time. Um, so uh, you know, some pre-harvest analysis of where the weaknesses are in your uh, harvest and drying system will go a long way to make things go better. And also uh, de deciding uh, your strategy uh, for how long you want to store your grain is something that should be thought through uh, pri way prior to harvest uh, to decide what is your target moisture, what is your target storage time, uh, because um, you know, after the grain is in the bin, you, you, your, your, your strategy is set for you uh, based on the, the moisture that you ended up with. Uh, you, obviously, you want to avoid high moisture contents, but that's, that's an easy thing to say. Uh, higher moisture contents also result in lower field losses, so it's a trade-off. But generally, keeping the, the initial moisture content below 25%, let's say, is, is, a, is, is something to be to strive for, um, that's controlled by the weather sometimes more than, than a uh, philosophy. Um, drier temperatures, uh, generally speaking, energy efficiency goes up at higher temperatures, uh, but too much energy or too much heat can damage the grain uh, for the end user, uh, and you may or may not see a direct benefit for that. Generally speaking, if you're using high drier temperatures, you're gonna have higher stress cracking. Uh, another way to manage uh, and control quality um, and dryer capacity during the harvest, if you end up having uh, higher than expected or higher than desired harvest moistures, uh, if you can set up uh, in-bin cooling or a bin dedicated to cooling, you can use, use the dryer only for, for the heating part of the drying operation. You can use the in-bin system to uh, cool the grain, which reduces stress cracking uh, tremendously, and then send it to the, the final storage bin. Uh, grain quality has been talked a lot about, especially in the academic community, uh, and I think a lot of times that gets focused on having the best quality grain possible uh, in, in hopes that you'll get uh, uh, a benefit when you go to market the grain. And that is somewhat true, but it's not really the driving factor. In my opinion, avoiding stress cracks uh, and having good quality kernels going into the bin makes for things to be much more manageable uh, as, the, as the storage season progresses uh, and much safer because you've got better quality grain that doesn't break apart and result in broken kernels. Um, so the stress cracks are the thing to avoid as much as possible given all the other things that change from season to season. Uh, storage moistures, uh, I think th this chart can get you in a lot of trouble if you don't read the fine print. Okay, many people have a mindset, especially with corn, is let's dry corn to 15% and move on. But really, uh, depending on how the grain is going to be managed and marketed, should determine the moisture content that you're aiming for. So if your operation is just going to hold uh, corn or sorghum uh, for just the first six months, like, like up until early March, 
then 15% is a pretty typical target moisture. Uh, but if you want to have the option of holding that grain into the early summer, summer months, uh, when grain prices tend to be better, uh, at the dryer or in the dryer design, you need to have the capacity to dry down to 13% and keep up with harvest. Uh, you can't dry it down after the fact uh, very easily at all. Um, so uh, that, that goes into the planning phase prior to harvest as to what is your target moisture uh, of the grain that you're going to put in the bin. And you can see all these uh, asterisks and footnotes here. This tells you something's up, is that these values are meant for good quality grain that's going to be clean and going to be aerated during these periods. So if you don't have... Um, um, or you discover that you have relatively high fines or higher fines, uh, that shortens the period of time. If the winter turns out to be an un unusually warm winter, this, these time periods are also shortened. So um, the 15% the moisture content, for example, for corn, 13 for soybeans, though that would be uh, a maximum for short-term storage in my mind. The other issue with storage or moisture content uh, in storage is that these moisture contents are, are averages um, and th that does not necessarily uh, correspond to storability. Uh, it might be better to think of the moisture content that you're aiming for a as a maximum that you measure as you go through the drying operation. Um, I think it was Mark Twain that said that if, you, if a man puts one foot in a bucket of ice water and another foot in a bucket of boiling water, on average, he's comfortable. And that's kind of what happens a lot of times uh, during real life when you're drying down grain, is that you have a wide range of moisture contents, and these pockets of high mo higher moisture content result in molds, mold spoilage, uh, hot spots, and those can tend to propagate uh, throughout the bin as the season moves, moves onwards. So that's, that's something we need to keep in, in mind is that uh, when we say 15%, uh, we want that to be you know, a very narrow range of moisture, not a broad range of moisture. And of course, there's many other variables that affect uh, the moisture content that you really want. I already mentioned the quality, uh, brokens and that sort of thing, but it also varies based on the composition of the grain um, and, and the temperatures that you're encountering. And here, here you can see these are uh, standard data that's published is that if you're going to end up storing at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, so for example for corn you're looking at maybe about 15 percent is an okay safe moisture content, but if you end up with a warmer condition you're talking about 14 percent, and that's a totally different target uh, as you go through the summer uh, or through the storage season. Okay, some other some other factors uh, that can be controlled uh, to quite a degree is the amount of brokens, the amount of foreign material. This goes to the dryer operation and to um, the uh, the combine settings. Uh, the, the key reason is is that yes, uh, the standard grades do change based on BCFM levels, uh, but but really the enemy is is the brokens and fines absorb moisture much more readily are easily attacked by insects and, and mold, will mold more quickly and that creates uh, headaches in the stored grain itself. Another headache caused by uh, broken and fines, BCFM, is this phenomena that you cannot avoid if you have brokens in your grain as you're filling a bin, filling a truck, uh, piling it on the ground, uh, it is guaranteed to happen that this, this material will separate from the whole kernels. And what happens is, is that the whole kernels uh, tend to roll or bounce down the pile as it's, as it's being emptied out of the spout, and the fine material and brokens tend to stay in the center of the pile. So you have this, this undesirable BCFM that's being concentrated in the center, typically in the center of the bin. And, and that creates problems down, down the line. So it'd be great if you have a, a, a resilient way of, of uh, spreading the, the fines in with the whole kernels and kind of keep it dispersed throughout, throughout the bin as you fill it up, uh, but those kind of have complications as well. Um, so what happens then is along this spout line, is that you have this concentration of BCFM. You may have on average only 5 to 10% BCFM, but in the center, 
it could be as much as 30 percent, 40 percent BCFM, and the air from your aeration fans will not penetrate very well through this spout line, uh, which means this area that's susceptible to absorbing moisture, molding insects, does not get much airflow. And so that is, is a difficult situation, uh, or increases the difficulty. Okay, so now we're moving closer to the reason for having aeration, or the main reason, is uh, controlling moisture, what we call moisture migration. Now this is, this is separate from the issue of grain quality. You can have the best quality possible and you will still have moisture migration. Moisture migration will be slower in high quality grain because you don't have all these avenues for water to be absorbed into the grain, but uh, it always happens because we always have temperature variations outside the bin, known as weather, um, especially in the upper Midwest where you have definite uh, well, usually you have definite summer, fall, winter, and spring. Okay, these seasonal changes, um, sometimes all these seasons happen in a week, but really we're talking about the longer term season changes, will induce these air currents to be flowing into the, in the grain bin. Okay, so um, they always happen because temperatures always fluctuate, and the purpose of aeration is to even out these temperature fluctuations as the storage period move, moves through the uh, fall, winter, spring, and even summer. So uh, after harvest, typically, we have colder weather. So as the air cools down, uh, you know, outside, the edges of the bin, the outside layers of the bin, uh, get cold. And of course, cold air sinks. And in the center, the, uh, the warm grain warm, keeps the air warm, and warm air will rise. So in properly dried grain with good quality, this happens just as well as it does in poor quality grain. And as this warm air rises, it picks up moisture from the grain and it moves to the top layers of the grain bin uh, where it can condense when it comes in contact with the cold fall winter air. And this is what causes condensation on the grain, uh, upper grain layers. It also can cause condensation on your bin roof and this is why uh, bin roofs need to be well ventilated uh, so that the uh, moist air can't build up in this headspace above the bin. Okay, so that, that's what happens in, in the fall, in the winter. You get that crust, at the characteristic crust at the top. And then in the spring, as things begin to warm up, uh, what will happen is, is that grain is a good insulator. I'll talk about that in a few slides here. But the, the, the warmer grain will, will cause the air to, to rise at the outer edges of the, of the grain bin, and then it will circulate and come in contact, and, and I guess another thing that's happening is the cold grain, the cold air sinks, so you have this convection current set up, and this will draw the warm, moist air into the top center of the mass, and the, the, the moisture will be deposited in the grain there, not necessarily at the very top level, but down at the top center uh, as spring and summer begin. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. And, a, and an illustration of moisture migration and how inevitable it is, is I, I, I got this uh, from my experience with my kids. They didn't like school lunches, so they were always taking their own their lunch to school. And they're always complaining at the end of the day is that well my sandwich was sandwich was soggy, uh, and so they they would put it in a tightly sealed lunch bag. And some days they would come home and say, okay, I know how I'm doing this. I'm putting it in two lunch two uh, sealed bags. And then uh, my youngest daughter said, well, I'm wrapping it with aluminum foil also, and it didn't work. And they didn't appreciate me telling them in advance that it wasn't going to work. But uh, what happened by the lunchtime was is that the sandwich uh, became soggy. And that is a real life illustration of moisture migration was the nice juicy meat, uh, the lettuce, the tomato all had water in it and the water migrates, in this case it's really diffusion, but uh, due to the cold layer on the bottom of the sandwich caused by the ice pack caused the moisture to migrate down. Now, if they put the ice pack on top, they would still had soggy sandwich on top um, so the, you know, the 
the remedy is is not very easy is i guess either you put in two ice packs or you put your lunch lunch in the refrigerator if you have that available to you but uh um that's part of the part of the issue is that's the illustration of the migration uh grain is a very good insulator and so um uh, we have to realize that that you, you can't expect the grain to evenly cool or warm up on its own uh you know uh, a typical home, a wall in a home is an R value of about 20, okay? That's equivalent to only 20 inches of stored grain thickness in the bin, okay? And when you've got these really big, uh, well, I have an example here of 18 feet. Really, I should show 48 feet. Uh, that's a lot of insulation. So so you, you can't hope for the temperatures to even out uh, by mid-June, for example. There will be temperature gradients um, due to this insulating. Um, effect. And this shows a, a simulation that after 10 months of storage, <clears throat> basically as summer begins, you'll have nice warm layers on the outer edge of the bin, but the center of the grain will be still quite cold. So in this, ex this simulation it was nearly like 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit on the outer edges of the, of the bin, but the center of the bin was around 40. And if you remember my illustration of migration is that this cold air is wanting to sink and the warm air is wanting to rise, so you have these convection currents that are going to happen if you if you don't aerate. So the, it's inevitable that you need to aerate to even out the, the temperatures. Another uh, good reason to aerate is for insect and mold control. Uh, lucky for us, uh, we have a fairly cold fall and winter, and that's our built-in refrigerator, and things always last longer than in the refrigerator than they do out sitting out in uh, ambient conditions uh, and so you can aerate to drop the temperature of the grain evenly at various times based on the weather uh, and, the, and the time of year and then you have to also recognize that uh, moisture migration and air currents are going to happen as the, the spring approaches so you need to aerate to even out the temperatures again so when it comes to insect control uh, you know obviously at nice warm temperatures insects are going to be very active. Okay, so we want to reduce as quickly as possible uh, the, the grain temperatures below 70 degrees. It actually has an effect on slowing down the insects, but if we can drop it between to below 60 to 50 degrees, um, that, will, that will very much uh, stop the reproductive cycle of insects without any chemicals, without any of that, and it gives us a lot more time in uh, storing the grain. If we can get it down to 30 to 50, the insects are completely dormant. Um, the insect problem is not growing. The insects are still there. If you can get it down to 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's not feasible many times, and it does create some management issues, uh, you don't necessarily, you may kill the insects, but you don't necessarily kill the eggs. So you've not wiped out the insect population in the bin. So, you know, certainly cooling it below 50, to 50, 60 degrees Fahrenheit is a very achievable, worthwhile thing, thing to do in your stored grain. And in general, what we're trying to do is we're trying to maintain a 10 to 15 degree difference between the average grain temperature and the average outside temperature. So the average of minimum and maximum outside. So that gives you uh, um, an even grain temperature, uh, which will reduce this moisture movement. Uh, just to be clear uh, and give you an idea of what's involved with aeration, is that aeration does not change the moisture level of the grain appreciably. Uh, so if the grain goes into the bin too wet, aeration is not going to fix that. Um, you can use it to lower temperature, and in the spring you might use it to bring up the air temperatures. Um, and prior to the aeration beginning, it's a good idea to core, what we call core the grain. This involves unloading the bin. Um, some, some guidelines are about 10% of the bin capacity. Or you can unload the bin to the point where the, the, the shape of the cone at the center of the bin uh, becomes slightly dished. Um, to, to pull out the center uh, spout line material and, and move that to, to a place where you can handle it. I guess I would recommend having it move, um, just send it to market directly. But uh, 
Um, this Im improves the uniform airflow. The airflows for aeration are much lower than a dryer. Uh, I think typical dryer airflows are 60 to 70 CFM per bushel. We're only talking like a tenth of a CFM per bushel for aeration. So you're just gently ventilating the entire grain mass, evening out the, the uh, temperatures. Um, so that's, that's the whole objective of the, of the aeration. Um, you can try and uh, use, certainly you can use automation as a, as, a, as a key way in reducing the amount of time in managing the aeration fans. So there's lots of uh, products out on the market now that do, do the, the, the nitty gritty planning for you. So at extremely high relative humidities, um, you probably want to have the aeration fans turned off. And at low humidities, you probably want to do the same thing. Uh, but it takes a lot of time to cause a moisture content change due to relative humidity change. I mean, we're talking on the order of, of a, a week or more. So it's not like overnight you've dried out your grain bin uh, or re-wetted it uh, accidentally. So it's, it's uh, not, not a, a huge worry, and you can certainly automate that. Um, so you'd only expect uh, a moisture change of like a half a percent at, at the most. Okay, you certainly want to check your system to make sure that the fan inlets aren't blocked. Uh, make sure all your control systems are working properly, especially after uh, you know a thunderstorm or something like that. A bin out away from the, the the farm residence or at the far end of the facility, whether or not it got struck by lightning, all the, all those sorts of things, uh, you know, re require some inspection. And then uh, you can't just go off and forget uh, a bin of stored grain. You really do need to check it regularly to see if there's problems that are developing and then decide how you might uh, uh, mitigate that, that problem. Um, and um, this is, if you can catch it early, it's the solution is easier than uh, if you catch it late. And I like to think of uh, the, the storage chain of events. You know, the, certainly many things are happening simultaneously uh, but there are, there are many things going on that if you can stop one, you can prevent the chain of events from progressing. So if you have temperature differences in your stored grain, uh, that's going to lead to moisture migration, regardless of what moisture content you, you stored the grain at. So even if it's at 13%, moisture is going to move around in the bin. You've got more time to deal with the moisture migration, but it still is going to happen. That'll elevate the, the moisture content. Uh, perhaps to levels that are higher than, than are safe. Uh, and that results in molds and insect activity. That activity results in crusting, which results in, in poor quality grain that doesn't flow. But if you can use aeration at the right time, that'll stop this chain of events from, from occurring or occurring as rapidly. And so it saves you a lot of hassle um, six, seven, eight months down, down the line. Uh, I recommend these uh, two sources, uh, resources, they're very good um, on managing uh, dry grain and storage. That's basically an aeration management guide. And then there's a storage handbook, um, both put out by the Midwest Plan Service that are very, very useful, very applied. So just to quickly summarize here, I think I've got a little bit of time, is that uh, just keep in mind that you need to design your dryer uh, system to reach the grain moisture that you want for the, the storage period that you want. Um, uh, st moisture levels are often the maximum recommended storage, storage levels and I think many times we think of the broad average is what we're aiming for but 15% uh, maximum would be a good rule of thumb rather than average. Uh, we're going to try and control temperatures with aeration even more uh, temperatures uh, reduces moisture migration. Uh, managing the temperatures basically allows you to maintain your quality. It won't improve it, but you, you can uh, strive to maintain it. Um, grain can retain its temperature and that will slowly slow down the deterioration. So if you can get a nice cool bin of grain uh, in the fall, uh, that'll slow the rates of all your problems uh, come springtime and summer. 
And of course, um, if you have better quality grain in the bin, it is going to be safer and cheaper to handle long term. So, Okay, that's the end of my talk. I'll be happy to uh, answer uh, questions now and at the end of the session, I guess. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rausch. I'm going to try this again. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Okay, fabulous. We did have a couple of questions come through uh, the chat box. And so what is the optimum dryer temperature for corn? Well, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Um, I think the current recommendations for the drier uh, temperature um, is, are around uh, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, that's a, as a result of, and that's a, only one value and it should be considered a range of values based on the incoming grain moisture, your, your drying system, uh, how much uh, bin tempering or cooling capacity you have if you're planning to use that or not. Um, but that's a balance of uh, speed of drying, uh, energy efficiency, and really uh, grain quality. Okay, thank you for that. Another one. Um, in the Midwest, what can you assume extra dry down will be during aeration at sub-zero temperatures? Oh, uh, wow. That is uh, sub-zero. I'm, I'm assuming sub-zero uh, Celsius. Uh, probably, probably not really sure. Um, <clears throat> first thing is I would have trouble assuming anything about Midwest winters. Uh, that would be one thing. Um, I would uh, definitely defer uh, very cold uh, grain management advice to Ken Hellevang up in North Dakota State University. He is an expert in that region of the country. Um, you know, really um, cooling down the grain is your main objective and trying to maintain even temperatures is the goal. When you're talking temperatures below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 Fahrenheit, uh, moisture migration is not a major issue at the time that uh, of winter time. So, um, I don't think you can really change the moisture content at those low of a, uh, temperatures. So that's not the objective of aeration anyway. So that's a okay. tough question. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more. What happens if you aerate with warmer air on colder grain? Well, <clears throat> theoretically, the moisture content will go up because you have the moisture in the warm air typically is also, warm air tends to be pretty moist, at least in the Midwest. And so the moisture contact theoretically would go up, but that takes a very long period of time. So you have to expose that grain to over a period of a couple of weeks to the high, higher temperature and higher humidity grain. Your objective right. is to even out the temperatures. So by the time you start to experience changes in moisture, you shut off the aeration fans. All right, and one last one. Thanks so much everybody for the questions. If we don't get to them now, our speakers will be here after the session to answer. Um, one last, is applying aeration during harvest evenings an issue while filling the bin? Yes, uh, you can begin aerating right away. Uh, typically, you would want if you have a large wet holding uh, bin that's ahead of your dryer, it's recommended to go ahead and uh, turn on the aeration fan right away for the wet holding bin because that warm wet grain is going to be respiring at a pretty high rate and that will be generating heat. Uh, that's not good for the grain. Um, so you want to aerate right away in that case. Uh, on the other side, uh, in the storage bin, um, you, you don't have to aerate right away because uh, the grain should be at a fairly uniform temperature and at a, a safe storage moisture. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much again for your uh, information. Again, our speakers will be here at the end of this session at noon to answer any questions we didn't get to. Um, let's go ahead. We do have a post poll, I believe, that will pop up on the screen here before too long. Excellent. Thanks so much. Don't forget to participate in the polls, everybody. These are very vital to the OSHA Harwood grant. Oh, my land. <laughs> Hashtag work from home. Um, <laughs> okay, so I see that we're getting our uh, our polls submitted. Please pardon my dog in the background. I, I sincerely I sincerely apologize for that, folks. None of this stuff happened in our speaker rehearsals, if you can imagine that. Um, okay, as our poll winds down, let's go ahead and introduce uh, our next speaker, John Lee. John is the S Director of Safety, Health, and Environmental Services Program at the Grain and Feed Association of Illinois. Here he focuses his time on helping grain handling facilities navigate safety and compliance issues and plays a consulting role in regulatory matters for EPA and OSHA. Welcome, my favorite safety geek and soon to be yours, John Lee. Welcome, John. Thank you, Jody. Yep. Appreciate that intro. <laughs> you want me to share? Are you going to do another poll? Or if, if you could um, go ahead and share, you're ready to go. Okay. Yep, that looks good. Can you see it? I'll, I'll ask you when I show my videos if you can hear it, but can everybody, you can hear me okay? Yep, everything looks and sounds great. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, Jody said, I'm, I'm with uh, John Lee with the Grain and Feed Association and, uh, of Illinois. And, and uh, essentially what I'm going to talk about today is uh, if you didn't follow Dr. Rausch's principles, what happens then? How to deal with bad grain and recognizing those hazards and how that relates to safety. So I, um, there's me, um, my, where, I, where I work. Um, my title there is Director of Safety, Health, and Environmental Services. So uh, I have the manly acronym at work of SHEES. Uh, there's also my contact information. If you ever have a question, please feel free to email me. So um, why bin entry fails? So here's a picture of a, on the right there, of a, a rescue taking place in Ohio. And it's a 70 plus year old uh, farmer and he was caught in that bin and it was a success story. He was, he survived, but what he was doing as uh, anybody who's been in a grain bin that looked like that, uh, he was uh, rotting the sump hole because of the quality of the grain. The quality went bad, probably moisture migration or it was too wet going in. And uh, he, as he was rotting, the unload system was still running. So once he unplugged it, he was along for the ride. And uh, luckily he didn't go all the way under apparently and uh, if you've never seen a green rescue tube, that's how, how they will get you out if you're ever caught. Uh, hopefully they can get you out um, alive. But uh, grain bin entry, and my last point there at the bottom is uh, on this slide is grain bin entry safety starts with grain quality management. W would that farmer have been in that bin if that quality was good? And I think we all know the answer to that. It's, it's no, uh, nobody gets in a grain bin for fun. It's not. Uh, something you want to do for fun, for sure. It's a lot of work walking in grain. You, you sink almost, you know, sometimes you sink to your knee, at least halfway up your knee. So here's another one. This was in uh, South Dakota. And I apologize if, if anybody's was involved with these accidents, but both of these were survivor stories. Um, all I've information I have is off the internet. So, uh, but it was a, a small, a farm bin, 15,000 bushels. And uh, I, the way I, I read the article, the, the victim was told they, uh, totally under the surface. So he was rotting the grain and he was pulled under and he went totally under the surface. And they knew it, the rescuers knew that. So in, uh, they were in a hurry, you know, if somebody's totally buried, you gotta get them out fast. So in a race against the clock, um, dozens of very first responders rushed to the Lincoln farmstead while Novak, who was a volunteer fireman, went down the road uh, for his backhoe to tear the bin open. And I'll talk about that more in, in a minute. But uh, usually they cut holes in the bin. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, rest, and the, the most amazing thing to me was when I read this was uh, the last bullet point there. Rescuers finally came upon the man just before two that afternoon, still alive after breathing through his teeth for most of, this, of his time trapped inside, more than one hour. So uh, 
could you imagine that being totally under the surface, black? Uh, you wouldn't know if anybody, um, that, that when it initially happened, I'm sure he didn't know that anybody was there to get him out. Uh, just, you'd have to be a very calm individual to survive that. And he's a very rare person um, to be totally submerged and survive. It does happen, but it is rare. So um, they uh, they tore a hole in the bin, all right. That's uh, that's getting pretty crazy. And uh, not to bet, you know, the, it was a success story, so I don't want to bash anybody, but when you start uh, cutting holes in grain bins, that can lead to all, all and knocking holes in grain bins, that can lead to all kinds of other problems. Um, you know, a circle of a grain bin is very strong as long as the pressure is equal, 360 degrees all the way around it. But once it gets unequal, it, uh, it bad things can happen. It usually will split right at the, where the first, where the holes cut. So if, if you know, fire department will normally cut a triangle and um, on one, they'll cut it at say six o'clock and then they immediately go and cut one at 12 o'clock because you want that the pressure coming off that bend equally. And then if they can, they'll go to uh, nine o'clock and three o'clock and cut holes. Getting off uh, side note there, um, but physical effects of entrapment. Could you imagine uh, the mental state of someone who's buried like, this is in a training session I was at and I was the next uh, training person to be buried. So I didn't let him take me down that far, but um, could you imagine the psychological effects of being caught like that? Um, I don't have it on my list here, but you know, humans have a fear of being entrapped or, uh, or buried alive. I know I certainly do. I've been in training sessions like the man there is. Um, but other issues you can have, you got chest expansion. You know, you can take a big breath in, but you can't exhale like normally. Uh, I've been caught to my armpits before and you can, uh, Um, you can breathe, but it's, you have to take shallow breath. So it's, it's very constricted. And then also, could, could you imagine uh, the average rescue takes three and a half hours to get someone out of the if they're caught. Uh, could you imagine what your legs would feel like? The, the lack of circulation, the constricted extremities, um, and of course your feet and legs are most affected. It's similar to uh, uh, suspension trauma, hanging in a, in a harness. When you're caught like that victim is, the blood is starting to pool in, in the lower parts of your body. And another thing that can happen is uh, you can get nitrous gas poisoning, poisoning or a, a something called a compression syndrome. And um, your blood chemistry is out of whack. And um, if, if a rescuer could just, uh, like in this case, in the picture on the left there, uh, that victim is uh, uh, tied to a harness, which is not always the case, but let's say that the fire department shows up and they could just uh, pull you out, yank you right out of there. Well, all the the nitrous gas causes, which causes bubbles in the blood. Well, it, it causes serious issues and can cause like stroke-like effects. Um, and all the toxins start to build up in the lower part of your body and it can rush back to your heart. So nothing good about uh, the physical effects of, of grain entrapment. But the reason the, the, the man in South Dakota survived is he did not, breathing through his teeth, is he did not aspire the grain and he did not ingest it. And that's what gets people is they suffocate. Most people panic right before they go under and they start screaming for help, which leaves their mouth wide open and then the grain goes in. And I, like I said, being trapped in training sessions, I can fully see why someone would panic. Um, and for someone to go totally under and breathe through their teeth is just amazing because you, most people hyperventilate and burn and use most of the oxygen up that was around them. Um, oh, and by the way, there is enough, there's barely enough oxygen in grain. I shouldn't say barely. There's enough oxygen in grain to breathe. Um, a 105 foot uh, diameter grain bin, 40% um, of that is air, but it's very restricted air the way you can breathe. So nothing good about that. So most common ways that incidents occur and, and Salah talked about this earlier in uh, conditions and hazards. Most of this, many, many of you have probably seen before, but drowning and flowing grain is, um, not in my experience, the fourth most common way people get caught. We, uh, also, mainly because of the quality issues. But it, you know, flowing grain acts like quicksand. It fills the voids. Um, I remember uh, there's a chart out there that says uh, a 5,000 bushel an hour unload speed, which is actually slow by commercial standards today. You could be trapped within six seconds 
and totally under in about 15 seconds. And uh, some of the big rail terminals around now, they, they unload at 40,000 an hour. Um, some of the rail uh, barge terminals, 60,000 an hour, 20,000 an hour. I mean, if, if you're in those situations and the grain is dished like the picture in the middle, um, you're literally gone in seconds. You're not just caught. But not that there's ever anything funny about grain entrapment, but um, this is probably the only funny thing I've ever seen. This is drowning and flowing grain for pit. And uh, you'll notice that they, they're eating the grain and uh, people always ask me, where was this, where's this at? And I got it off of YouTube and it was a, a processing, food processing plant in Europe, that's all I know. And, uh, but they're eating the grain, they, they uh, and the grain is flowing out and they try to put their wings out, it does no good. So the victim is on top of the grain and is rotting it, it's not flowing and then they get it flowing, you become the pigeon. That's why you never ever get into bed and rot it above. Um, the best one is the last one. It uh, comes in from the left, coming up here shortly. But uh, smart ones fly away, but some of them don't. I, I thought this was funny, but it, it really shows how someone, how the birds get trapped and how someone can get trapped. Here's my favorite when it goes in head first, it doesn't even try to stop. So I've already mentioned it, but. Um, the number one cause of grain entrapment is rotting grain from above. Like the like the act, both accidents I've talked about earlier and then this one here, or this incident here on the left. Um, is that good quality? Obviously not. That's not the kind of grain anybody wants, farmers or commercial grain companies. Um, probably what happened here is what Dr. Roush talked about is moisture migration or uh, the grain was too wet when it went in there and it, the molds formed and then it crusted. And then they started flowing it and there was some good grain that would flow. And then the chunk, a chunk went down in the sump hole, like the picture on the right, this guy's in there with the PVC pipe trying to unplug that. And uh, probably the conveyor's running. And, uh, you know, if you ask a victim this happens to that gets engulfed by doing that, you ask them, why did you go in there with the unload equipment running? And they'll say, well, I can't find the, the plug unless it's running. And that, that's true, but uh, it's much easier to find it when it's running because once you get it, you know, because the grain starts moving. But it's also a good way to get yourself killed. So never ever do that. that but that is the number one way people get caught. And uh, it's a prime example of quality causing a problem. And this guy, that the, that quality is so bad, it will probably, the bad quality in cost him or caused him to be engulfed or potentially engulfed. But it, it, if he goes under, it'll probably save his life because it'll plug again before it, he gets down all the way. You know, you go around to grain companies and I'm sure farms, um, you'll see PVC pipes laying around or a piece of rebar. And uh, th those, th that door, that, th that rebar there is just holding the door open, isn't it? It's not, it's a rotting stick for going in and, and rotting sump holes. It's a, it's a common problem, it happens all the time. Bean pods get over the hole, uh, the chunks of grain or corn, you know, whatever. Um, don't want to get on my hot horse here, but you know, they always say uh, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, those rods don't kill people, but what you do with them can kill people. So anytime you're, you have a rod in your hand, there's potential for an engulfment. And here's an example of one that I dealt with. Uh, the first two incidents I talked about, I was not just internet information, but uh, this one is from, I, I personally dealt with this. This is five miles from my house. And it's a commercial grain company, a smaller one. And the victim here, was uh, 60 years old and he had 41 years experience in the grain industry. And it wasn't that 41 years was just at this facility. It wasn't at, um, in grain industry in general. It was, so he, his whole adult life, he worked at this facility. So, you know, he's, he did what he, he has done what I'm gonna show you. He did to get uh, entrapped before. The bin wasn't really big. It was a 50,000 bushel an hour bin and there wasn't a lot of grain in it. About, uh, just about time to start cleaning it out just getting to the bottom, about 15,000 in there. And from my experience, more than half of grain entrapments happen from side entry. So, uh, I'll come back to that point later. But in this case, uh, I've been showing you chunks of uh, corn getting caught in the sump holes, but in this case, it was bean pods plugging up a sump, which is another common problem. 
every place I go to, every grain company I go to talks about how there's more pods in the beans than there used to be, and it's re re causing all kinds of problems. That's what happened here. And uh, this bin only had one center reclaim hole, one, one center sump. And uh, the manager thought the floor was ex almost exposed and, and the, the guy wasn't in any danger, but he, and he's working alone. This was a real small company that had a, um, a manager, this guy and uh, the victim and a part-time secretary. So they, you know, they should have two people when you enter a bin, an intern and observer, and they did not do that. That was one of the problems. So this is a reenactment photo, but the victim went in just like the other examples I showed you and there he's rotting, trying to clear the uh, uh, bean pods away from the reclaim hole. And he cleared it and he went down just like the pigeons did. And um, he went, but he went further than the guy on the left there, my other example, he went totally under the surface. So he's another fully engulfed person. And believe it or not, that's not the worst thing that happened to him. The worst thing that happened to him was, is when he went down, he went right to the reclaim hole and his foot went in to a running screw auger and uh, caught his foot into two flights of the screw auger. And then luckily for him, this was a 240 volt uh, system, not a super big motor on it. And uh, it tripped everything. So here, the, and it probably acted as a tourniquet when it cut into his foot, so it was twisted it up, but it wasn't bleeding like that. But now here the poor guy is, he had no observer, Nobody knows he's caught and he's totally under the surface. So um, probably what saved this guy was, is he's a religious coffee drinker and he always comes in at 9.30 or 10 for his coffee and he didn't do that. And they went looking for him and realized, oh my gosh, he's totally buried. So they called the local fire department and uh, they came and did a, a wonderful job getting the grain away from the person, from the victim. They cut uh, nine holes in the bin and up here, so the triangles, what, uh, how they normally do that, uh, rather than knocking a hole in the bin. Normally the point is down though. Um, so they tried everything to get his foot out of that uh, screw auger. They tried a pipe wrench, sawzalls. They were even considering a torch, I think, and they could not get it out, get him out. Um, but the, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but so the they got the grain away from him. Rel I mean, it's never easy to move grain, especially by hand like that, but you know, you cut holes in a bin like this and then the grain hits its equilibrium and then it won't flow anymore. And almost every engulfment that I've been involved with where they do this, they try the Armstrong method of shovels and scooping the grain away to keep it flowing. And then they get smart and get a tractor or a loader or a backhoe and move it uh, mechanically or with a mechanization. So, Back to the, they, them, the fire department trying to get him out of the uh, screw conveyor. So they tried everything, the pipe wrenches, the turning it backwards, everything. And five hours after he was caught, they estimate, they're still trying to get him out of there and they can't. His vitals are starting to drop, there's EMTs. And uh, so they gave up and they uh, called a trauma surgeon who was airlifted out to this grain facility and they did a field amputation. So I went in there as a, uh, one person and came out in two pieces, uh, but he survived. Believe it, very tough individual, totally under the grain, foot in an auger, and he still survives, only to die uh, five weeks later of a blood clot. Uh, and by the way, his, his leg, we lost his leg about mid shin, but uh, unfortunately the poor man didn't make it, but it was five weeks after the case. Could this have been prevented? It certainly could have using uh, but, an entry policy, you know, safety policies, locking everything out, OSHA entry policies, following 1910-272 for grand entry. So um, I wanted to add this in here. So that the every victim I've showed, every accident I've showed here is from top entry, but they happen from the side. And here's a good example how they can happen from the side entry. So the, the two guys in the circle there are, um, they're circled with the yellow. They went in a door like the guy up here on the top they came in a side door like that. And when they were, when they went in, it was only about ankle deep and they weren't in any danger. The, the conveyors were locked out, but then they went, they came in and then they crawled up the pile and started breaking, trying to break up these pyramids, columns. Uh, is that a good place for them to be? And of course the answer is no, that's a horrible place for them to be. Uh, I worry about the pyramids breaking, but I might even worry around this area even more. It looks like it's crusted a little bit. And if that gives way, it's gonna undermine their feet and they're in big trouble of an avalanche. They could uh, 
they could be totally buried, be in the prone position, totally covered in grain. You wouldn't even have a clue where to look for some, look for them. So I just wanted to mention it. Just because you don't enter from the, the top, or I'm back up for a second. A lot of companies have went with policies where they don't enter from the top and think that's going to solve all their bin entry hazards. Many of the, the incidents happen from side entry. And uh, this, this just proves it. I mean, it, it can happen. Anytime you go in, you got to evaluate. And uh, also, there, most of the entries happen from side entry anyway. So that's probably a uh, law of averages. When you go in a bin, you need to evaluate, look around on the walls. Um, you can see on this case, there's bean pods plugging up the bin or sorry, stuck to the sidewall. Um, I was talking to a company yesterday. I was doing a meeting for them, training and uh, safety training for them. And they said uh, last the last year they found a what they estimated a 400 bushel chunk of grain stuck to the wall up about 30 feet in the air. So that would roughly be 2,000 pounds of grain that hanging up above your head with nothing underneath it. Okay, um, moving forward here. So most common way is people rotting the sump hole. The second most common way people get caught is uh, from an avalanche. It could be something along the wall, like the one on the left there, or it could be a tower or a column in the middle. The third biggest cause of engulfment is bridging, which and which um, where you get a crust on the surface, and then you get an air pocket, and uh, then flowing grain. And I will show. I'll go into a little more detail in each one of those. So um, every flowing material has an angle of repose it wants to go to. Um, corn. Soybeans, wheat, uh, gravel, sand, fertilizer products, any flowing material. And this chart here shows what corn, the angular pose for corn should be, or at least the kind of corn that you want. Uh, between 21 and 23. Um, and the problem is if it's if someone goes in a bin and it's hung up on the, along the wall, like this uh, illustration here on, on the bottom right there, um, there could be a crust on the surface of that. Well, let me back up for a second. Sometimes you could hit something like that with a pickaxe and nothing happens. Other times there's a crust on the surface that's barely holding the good grain that's behind it. And that good grain that is behind it wants to go back to its natural angle of repose. So if you break up this crust, the, uh, it will avalanche very fast. And you'll have no chance to get out of the way and it can knock you down and you could be in the prone position on the floor covered in depending on how big the bin is, 20 feet of grain, eight feet of grain, 15. So obviously that's not a place, that's not how you break something like that up or try to make it flow. You don't go right next to it. Uh, other, you know, other commodities, the ones that I know off the top of my head, uh, soybeans are 20, is 25 degrees angle repose and wheat is 28. And uh, then their numbers will be a little, uh, it'll be a little, since it's steeper, it'll be a little, little higher on the wall with wheat and soybean. Here's another example. You know, obviously you, you wouldn't want to come in with a rod underneath this. And I mean, that looks pretty bad. It, it might not break free, but if you undermine enough of it, if the good stuff comes flowing around it, that, those could come down as a, <clears throat> all is one mass or that, that, that's an avalanche waiting to happen. A crust or hung up grain. Here's one, here's a couple examples. This, the one on the right there looks like a, uh, a roof vent leaked, like a chimney kind of effect. You know, that that type of situation, I would just uh, leave it and keep unloading if it does, if it will unload, and it'll probably fall on its own. You wouldn't have to have anybody in there trying to knock it down, but um, you wouldn't want to be underneath it. Gravity is generally your friend in grain handling, but not in these situations. The picture on the left is a 65 foot feet tall tower of grain. And this was from 2010. You know that grain came out of the fields at 31 percent, and they were able to dry it down to, you know, maybe 25 or 23. And a lot of broken kernels, like Dr. Roush had, a lot of fines, and uh, they it probably plugged up on them pretty early, and they couldn't core the bin, and then they had a mess. But that is exactly what happens if you don't potentially could happen if you don't core a bin. Like Dr. Roush talked about it, which is the, you know, you got to clear out the spout line where the grain fills. You're always going to have broken kernels and, and little pieces there. This is a little device that I uh, made. It's, it's like an hourglass and it's um, coarse sea salt, cinnamon, and pepper. And uh, my wife is the Vanna White there. She's going to uh, flip that over and you can watch it uh, 
watch it form. Watch the watch the the fines build up in the middle. This is a prime example of why you need to core the bit. See the cinnamon in this area is, is building up heavily and then air won't go through that. It's gonna heat up more and more and more. And then you potentially could have a 65 foot tall mess in your bed. So it's it's critical that bins must be cored after as soon as you can after harvest. Um, unfortunately, a lot of farm bins cannot be um, cored. They're just not set up for that type of thing. Um, but if, if it's all possible, you need to core it. So here's another system. Dr. Roush mentioned it uh, about a spreader. And here's an example of a spreader in a commercial bin. I don't I know how big a bin this is for, but uh, this is spreading out the, the pine. Great. And if you can spread out those, the, 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 that spout line, you still should uh, you still should um, pour the bin, but it, it helps a lot with that. Then the air can get through it. I know some people have trouble setting these and the grain doesn't come out of every one of those shoots and there's issues, but when they're working, they're, they're really, really nice. I can't even, I'm not even going to describe this. I'm just going to play this video. This is a TikTok video and uh, who would know somebody my age would have TikTok, but uh, I actually don't have TikTok. I got this from somebody else, but just watch this video. Then I'll discuss it. So I hope you're appalled at, at having seen those people, those kids in that bin. That is that uh, they should never be in that bin. It was, the grain is uh, 20, this is 2019 harvest in North Dakota, which was very wet. And I'm sure that grain went in there at who knows what moisture and they've got a serious mess. Um, I have never seen a, a, a column or a tube of grain that far down and that goes all the way to the bottom. So they tried to unload it and, and the center came out or maybe they cored it and the center came out early and then they let it sit and they've got a serious mess. But you'll notice that is a steel weed trimmer with a cultivator tiller attachment on it. And um, what, what he's doing there is he's, he's digging a tunnel through that area and let me play it again. So he's digging a tunnel through there and once he, gets through that tunnel, that whole section where those, these two guys are standing could collapse and those guys could fall straight down, to, who knows how far down to the very bottom of that bin and, and you would never get them out. It would be, you'd have to unload the whole bin to get to, for body recovery. That, that, is, uh, that is insane. This is the kind of type of thing you would never enter. Have, people should never be in that. So then, so then uh, third biggest cause is bridging, which is where you get uh, the, Dr. Rouse talked about the moisture migration, which causes condensation on the surface. And uh, if it's bad enough, probably some other issues that went in there too wet. Um, the crust forms, and then as you pull out of the bin, air pockets form. And if workers or farmers don't know that how much grain has been pulled out, and you know if, if you pull 20 loads out of a bin and it should be dished and it's still flat or still up a little bit, that's what can happen. And then you walk out there, don't realize it, and uh, it breaks and you fall through. And, and then you could be totally engulfed or may just be partially engulfed, but either way, it's not, not good. Um, some of you probably heard the, uh, I call it a rural legend where the whole bin is empty of grain and there's a crust, just a crust. So that from here down is nothing. And then there's a 18 inch crust across the top. And you've heard stories where people have went up, crawled in and walked on that and then came back out and they go white as a ghost because people tell them that was empty. We emptied that last week. I know um, three people that was around a stack of Bibles. They've seen cases where the whole bin is empty uh, and, and nothing underneath it. And one of them was it was a 60 foot diameter bin. This, this fellow was an auditor and um, 60 foot diameter bin with 18 inch crust and nothing underneath it. Fairly rare on the on the bigger commercial bins. It, if it does happen, it's probably going to break on its own. Back up here, oops. Back up. Um, if it does happen and it breaks on its own, and you didn't even know it was in there, where do those trims go? They go down in the sump hole, and then somebody might want to get in there and try to rot it. So it's 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 all you know quality. 
Well, here's another video. This I don't know where this is from. This is another TikTok video. Now this is quality corn. Taking five loads out of this bin and we still can't get through it. Why won't it come down? Whatever. We'll just keep jumping. So that's pretty crazy, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Let's start off. I'm going to play this and then I'm going to stop it in certain areas and discuss it. Now this is quality corn. Now this is quality corn. So he did step over a running PTO. That's uh, number one. Is that a smart idea? That is a very, very bad idea. Never, ever get be anywhere in the vicinity of a running PTO, even if it has a shield on it. Even with good shields, people can get caught at the knuckle or at the, at, at the knuckle area. So that's really bad. That, you know, lucky people, if they get caught in a PTO, it rips all their clothes off. One minute they're fully clothed, the next minute they're in their underwear. And unlucky people, uh, it bodily flings them around it or rips your arm off. So, uh, continue. Taking five loads of... Oops. Shoot. Every time I try to do that, I won't play it again, but he took five loads out of the bin. I'm sorry, let me play it one more time. Now, this is quality corn. Taking five loads out of this bin and we still can't get through it. Why won't it come down? Okay, five loads out of the bin and it won't come down. Well, that's, this kid knew how much grain was taken out and still didn't follow the rule. So that grain is sprouting. Um, why it isn't falling through right now, I don't know. There, there could be like a tower or a pyramid underneath where he's at. Um, he's walking on it and he's not sinking in. If, if you walk in grain and you don't sink in, you got a serious, you got a problem. You shouldn't be in there. Um, the other thing it would probably smell I'm sure there'd be a fermenting smell uh, and sprouting grain. Uh, that's never good. Whatever. We'll just keep jumping. He did break on the other side. So here's what could have happened to him. This is an illustration from a uh, another video. Oops. Not too many people. Uh, so this is what could have happened to him. And then totally engulfed. And not too many people stroll through a grain bin with their sports jacket over their shoulder, though, or their cardigan. So hazard controls. So you got a serious problem in a bin. What's your plan for identifying and controlling the hazards? Do you enter the bin? Hopefully you don't have to. You can do it from out, from outside. And uh, that's what I'm going to go over here is um, safer options for out of condition grain, alternatives to bin entry to get, you got bad grain and you want to get it out and you don't want to get somebody hurt. So ways to get it out of the grain without being inside of it. And this would be, you see the circle of the arrows through it. This would be the not how to do it. Corn is bridged up. Trying this one. Woo! That is an M80, I think. I can't, I, I hope I, I can't even, you know, I'm, I'm speechless, I'm tongue tied. So for, you know, for a grain dust explosion to happen, it takes ignition, oxygen, fuel, and an enclosed area. There's not a lot of enclosure there, a lot of confinement, because it's an open bin, roof's open, but there's, he's got uh, fuel, he's got grain dust, he's got oxygen, and he just um, put a man made, put flame inside the bin. I'm a, there could have been a flash fire and, and he could have been Wile E. Coyote looking in the hole and, and blasting his face. Don't ever do that. That was, it's meant to be funny and don't ever do that. So, um, well, alternatives to getting in a bin if you got a problem. So I'm going to go through each one of these, but just to list them here, turn the fans on. You got a pyramid or a tower. Maybe you can get lucky and, the, and let the fans run and it, maybe it'll fall down on its own. Rod from a, a tunnel from underneath, if hopefully you, if you have a tunnel, uh, use an extended pole to reach or knock down grain from outside. 
um, use a grain bag or a back truck to clean out the bin, use compressed air to dislodge the grain if it's a sump hole plugged really bad, or hire a commercial bin service, cleaning service. Well, here's a, a lot of you in the audience, I'm sure have done things like this. So there's a, where that circle is, there's a plate that screws on there with, if this, this is a sump hole drop to a, to a conveyor, take that plate off, you stick your rods up in there, you get it flowing, you're not on top of it, you don't become engulfed, it's, it's the way to go. We make, you might make a little mess down here, clean it up, not a big deal. That, that is the way to do it. Fortunately, not every bin has a tunnel to get into. A lot of the, uh, the newer bins have a, a, above ground tunnels and uh, hopefully yours are uh, where you can walk in them. Some of them are only about five feet tall. Uh, so this guy here is, he's rotten. Uh, there's a, in most bins, if you have a tunnel, we'll have either the companies make ports, have the mill rights do it, or it's part of the manufacturer, but he's rotting up through, in, up into the, to unplug a sump hole. Um, and I don't know if any of you in the audience have ever done this and stuck a rod up in the, in the bin, in the sump hole, and you know it's not flowing and you're sticking the rod in and you've got it almost all the way in there and you still don't feel any resistance. You can't figure out what's going on. Well, you, if you've ever done that, you probably experienced something like this. And to me, this is a better, more common example of bridging where you've, uh, you, you may have created that little pocket with your rotting. So it wouldn't be too smart to go in the bin and go on top and start poking it if, you've, if you stick your rod up from underneath and you don't feel any resistance. And uh, I was talking to a guy last year that said they had a bin that he stuck a, let me back up on this one, stuck a, what he said was probably an eight, 15 to 18 foot piece of PVC pipe. So it was somewhat flexible or was flexible so he could bend it and get it up in there. And he had it almost all the way in where it was just his hand and the end of the rod were in there. And he's moving it all around him that he far around as he could and he couldn't feel anything. So they had experienced that he was experiencing a very big uh, cavity there, very big bridge. So let's say you don't have a tunnel and there's where you can physically get into it and rod from underneath. Um, well, then you've got a, a, and you have to go in and rod it. Well, you, you have to follow all the OSHA entry procedures and company policies. You know, you lock everything out so the conveyors can't flow. Wear a har um, body harness with a lifeline and you'll see this victim, or not victim, should say victim, uh, worker has got, looks like a cable, probably a, to, to a tripod. Um, so he's connected with a lifeline harness and then he has an observer that's not the same entry, but different entry, you know, permits, you know, um, bin entry permits, confined space permits, whatever you use. Very, you know, that's like your pre-flight checklist you go through, look for hazards, stuff hung on the walls, other issues, and then atmospheric checks. So um, last resort, but if you have to do it, it can be done safely. Um, so this, this is his uh, lifeline, and then this is probably a belay line with a rope, so that when they, when they crank him up, they can pull him over to a ladder. <clears throat> Here's some like pre-bend treatments. So this company, had, this is a soybean tank, and they have a lot of trouble with pods building up um, around the sump. So they welded nuts onto the slide gate, and then there's threaded rod in these pipes, and then they can take those off when they run to clean it with a sweep auger. And then when they get ready to fill it for harvest, they put them back in. And then if this plugs up with pods, they can slide, hit the slide gate on the outside, slide this back and forth and clear the pods out of the way. They have to use a, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but they, the slide gate has a persuader bar welded to it so they can whack it with a sledgehammer if they need to. You know, if you got a bin with no tunnel, things like this to me are invaluable. Here's another one, no tunnel in this bin. So they've put a pipe on top of the floor and uh, they, this company assures me that the sweep auger can get over it and it's not an issue. And then this is the, this is the inside right over the stumps and then outside and they can pull that you know, sideways and then back and forth and try to clear issues out of the way. Great idea, in my opinion. If you, haven't, if you have no tunnel and you need to clear something, here's some other things you can buy. Uh, this is the Brock well guard. I think this comes on um, the new Brock bins or Brock bins. I'll sell it to you. It's a, uh, so the, the theory is the chunks come down and then this breaks them up and then it'll still flow and make them into smaller pieces and still get into the sump hole. Same thing here. This is a homemade thing that a lot of, or some grain companies have done this over the years. It's a, like a pyramid. And then the, the theory is the grain the chunks come down, it hits this and breaks it up and then you can still flow grain. 
other people, some people swear by these, other people cuss them. They say that the chugs just break into two pieces and then they build up, build up, build up, and then you've got a tube of them. Um, and then the bottom left picture there is a called a mini sump saver. And I believe this thing is hydraulically driven and it sets around the sump area or over it. In this case, I think it's right over it. I think they usually set them close to it. And then it spins like a tiller and breaks up chunks. So just different treatments you can do before. Uh, I mentioned in the, my list there at the beginning of this section, using a long pole from the outside. You can't see it in this picture, but the company had, as you can see, a bad, an issue. They didn't want their people to be in there. So they have this long rod, which looks like it's a homemade thing, scraper type thing on a pole. And then they've cut a hole in the, in the panel of the bin, small hole just for a grain back. And they've got it shoved in as far as they can get it. And then from the door, they're rotting the grain to try to get it to flow. And then it would pull down. Hopefully, eventually all that will undermine and you can do it, you know, will start to flow. Nobody that works outside at a grain elevator or uh, anybody's ever used a grain back very much doesn't like grain backs that much. They're um, not the greatest thing in the world to do, but you got a serious problem, you can uh, do with the company with the rod, just the previous slide, you know, fish the fish the backhoes in as far as you can and just try to bend, uh, under, you know, uh, unload the grain and try to undermine issues, let, it, let them fall on their own without having people in there. Or, or some people will hire a, a vac truck um, a big, huge one, which has, you know, they have a, it's a, for cleaning, like in my area, it's the Bodine group out of Decatur, Illinois, has those. Um, and they have serious horsepower and they can really, really suck a lot. So, but if your employees, for any, any task employees do, you have to do training and uh, people have killed, have engulfed themselves with grain bags. And it's usually someone doesn't know what they're doing and they go up on a pile of grain that's six, eight feet deep or more, and they start backing right at their feet. And they basically just suck themselves right in. And if, if that would happen, and it, the tobacco was at your feet, and the more you pulled it up, the faster you would go down. So I've never dealt with that situation, but it, it has happened. I've read stories of it. Um, it's one of the few cases where uh, quality of the grain is not an issue for a golfer. And then the last one is, uh, Extreme situations, you know, some people will rent these big air compressors like you run a jackhammer with, and then they'll make air cannons. I, I guess you, that's, that's a horrible way to say that. Um, and then you can make it really long, make these as long as you need. And then you can uh, air blast one of those columns or come up from underneath and unplug a sump hole. Um, but if you ever use something like this, it's You've got to follow all safety procedures. You got to use the safety clips for these Chicago fittings. Um, minimum PPE would be safety glasses, gloves, and hearing protection with all that air. Um, the Salah and the University of Illinois has a grant and they're going to study this method for unplugging bins. Uh, and the results should be out in a year or two, I believe. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with on that. I'm gonna I'm gonna help with that as much as I can. And then lastly, if it's so bad, throw up your hands and hire a commercial bin cleaning service. You know they have these bin whips. I know the ethanol industry uses them a lot, and uh, feed does sometimes. Stuff gets really caked up in the bin, and they have these whips that uh, will go down there. It's almost like an old mate, like a mace, like a knight in shining armor would use. Whips around, knocks things down. Um. So five critical steps to entry. The first thing is, is the permit checklist. I mean, and what that is for is to evaluate what's going on. It's like a pre-flight checklist the pilot goes through and uh, bin entry safety is all about evaluating what's in there. And then you have to lock everything out, all the unloading equipment, uh, you have to check the atmosphere, lifeline if it's, if it's applicable, if it's effective at that point and never work alone. You always have to have an observer and the observer job is a full-time job. There would be so many people, farmers and commercial grain people, if they would have followed the lockout tag out, L-O-T-O, uh, turn that equipment off. What it comes down to is never get in a grain bin that could flow on purpose through the um, unloaded systems, the conveying equipment, or unexpectedly from an avalanche. Don't ever be in a bin that could do those two things and you won't be engulfed. And don't let this happen to you. 
um, for many, I mean, pretty obvious goes without saying, but uh, that's a typical rescue. It, I, I have a friend of mine who works in the fire service and uh, he says he wouldn't even attempt a rescue without 25 or 30 people. It's just hard work to get in the grain. Um, and a lot of the victims that uh, survivors, especially farmers, when you see, see the interviews, uh, the emotion they feel the, the most is shame. They feel bad because they knew better than what they did. And uh, of course, protect your most valuable resources, your workers. And that was all I had, Jody. Excellent, thanks so much, John. Was I over my time? I was, was I good on time? Yep, yeah, you're, you're spot on. Those videos, there were a lot of comments in the chat box too about people just cringing and having so much anxiety watching those. Um, always, always entertaining. And there was a comment that I kind of wanted to start with um, from Russ Seegers, well-known in the grain industry here in Illinois. And he said, all organizations that produce, store and handle grain must come to a higher level of maturity and safety and grain quality, or the industry will continue to suffer setbacks that will cause further injury, death, profit, risk, and public mistrust. And I think if that isn't That's a spot on. comment, yeah. I'm going to save that one and steal that. That's great. <laughs> I couldn't say it better myself. Russ, Russ is full of them, but you know, I, I think that's just a perfect comment really to sum up today's program and the entire purpose of Stand Up for Grain Safety Week. So um, before you guys go, don't leave yet. We do have some important things to announce and some additional Q&A. Let's go ahead and we have our last poll, I believe. And so we'll, we'll get our poll up here. Please participate in that. And then if you guys have any um, questions or uh, comments, please feel free to put those in the chat box. So John, we did have a couple of, of questions. This is a two-parter. Um, can you go into the significance and process of how to cut into a bin? So two, two part there, you had mentioned um, in one of your photos that they really kind of did a number on the bin. So can you talk about the significance of how to, and how to properly cut into a bin? Well, first of all, don't do it unless you have to. It's, it's not a good thing to do. Um, last report, um, but like I said, you know, a circle is very strong as long as the pressure is equal. So if a bin, if you cut a hole and the grain starts coming out, you're gonna create a um, angle of repose down to that hole and uh, the pressure is gonna be unequal and that bin will, will collapse inwards on the, where you cut the hole, it'll flatten it out. And then worst case scenario, it will uh, um, split the bin open and on top of everybody. And then you have like a whole bunch of engulfing. And then to do it right, I mean, if you, you know, it happens where you have to for salvage and, and issues happen, some issues other than grain entrapment happen. And you got to cut a hole at, I use the 12 o'clock, you cut the first one at 12 o'clock and then immediately go cut one at um, six o'clock opposing holes. And then you should do one at three and nine to get that grain come down even. Um, and then, you know, these commercial bins, it's uh, either a lot of them are triple sheeted. It's a, it's a big deal to cut into those things. And to try to bend them up, you know, it's, it's a big deal. All right, thanks for that. Um, and I should also add, if you would rather ask a question privately, again, my name is Jody Brooks. Go down to the chat box and send me a private message, and then I can ask that out loud if you'd like. If you'd rather not put it in the chat box. All right, John, is there a solution for farm bins that can't be cored? I, I, that's probably a Dr. Roush question. I, I mean, uh, the okay. more you're moving, the better off you'll be. Um, um, some of these, you know, you know, load with portable equipment. Um, get it out as fast as possible. Don't leave it in there all for a year. That'd be my solution. Okay, we'll we'll bring all of our speakers on here in a couple of minutes to answer additional questions. Um, there was another few, and don't forget, everybody, our speakers will be here after to answer questions that we might have missed. Uh, from Amanda, have you ever heard of reversing the auger or putting golf balls in the auger? I think that's to relieve a, a block. Or a, a Never heard block. of that one. Never heard of that one. Yeah, it might work. That golf ball thing could be interesting. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's see. I think there was one I got in the chat box. Many of those examples seem to be from farms. How can larger operations reach out and provide resources 
or where can smaller operations which don't fall under OSHA rules find grain entry and emergency training resources? Well, I guess I could plug the Grain Handling Safety Council. There's a lot, grainsafety.org. There's a lot of information about that. Um, 1910-272, what the commercial grain companies follow is, is a good guideline for anybody. It's not, it's not egregious, it's common sense things. Those are, um, there's, you know, Purdue University has a lot, University of Illinois has a lot of information, Iowa State. Um, Google grain entrapment prevention and you'll find all kinds of help. Okay, is there a solution for rescuing when dealing with commercial concrete bins? It's a big deal cutting, you know, you don't cut holes in those for sure. Um, don't get caught, I guess. It's, <laughs> um, yeah, so, some of these are a little bit more involved too. Um, that one's you know, probably a little harder. If somebody's, you know, concrete, I mean, it happened last, uh, not, not last January, but two Januarys ago. And it's a big deal. You almost, you have to come in from the top and you have to remove grain. In that case, it, was, it wasn't a lot of grain in it and it wasn't really an engulf and it was a fall. But uh, that's a big issue. Every engulfment entrapment is different. And, uh, you know, you got to get the grain away from them. You know, you got to shield the victim somehow, usually a tube. You can't just yank them out. And then you got to get the grain away from the person. You're rescuing the grain from the person, not the person from the grain initially. Mm -hmm pressure off of them and then they can you can get them out at that point so I guess I don't have a good answer for that um, well that, that's okay I think that's great um we do have a couple additional comments in the chat just kind of um going back to the coring bins on farm so again don't forget to put your comments in the chat or your questions or both um, can we go ahead and have our other two speakers get on camera and then I did um We'll give uh, Dr. Rausch an opportunity to address the on-farm bin coring. Any any potential solutions or ideas as far as that's concerned? Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I you know I think uh, if you if you empty the bin or attempt to core it and nothing comes out, I think uh, the safety guidelines that were talked about using rods from the outside to try and cause the grain to flow again um, is, is your only solution. I think that's what the issue was, is that uh, you cord it, but then not all of it comes out, so you know you have a problem. Um, so you apply the safety guidelines that we've already discussed. I, I think that's the answer. I don't really know what else. I don't, you know, the smaller the bin is, the supposedly the easier it is to get get the problem fixed and, and that sort of thing. Um, so. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Dr. Issa, how do you calculate the fatality rate? Is it incident based? The fatality rate in, in these uh, reports are it just based on the number of cases that we're documenting. So it's, uh, it's just the number of fatalities that we have documented divided by the total number of cases. Uh, these uh, these cases are obtained from majority is from news clipping uh, services among uh, other items. So it's it, we have to look at them that these numbers are not final. They represent basically the minimum amount of cases we were able to document, and that there is more. Uh, there's various. Uh, like analysis we've done, uh, basically backhand calculations, that where you could say that, uh, you know, the actual number of incidents might be 30% more up to double, uh, depending on, you know, the parameters or variables you're using. All right, thanks so much. And one last one, what is uh, the main commodity for grain entrapments? What's the biggest culprit? Corn is the number one. I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead, Saul. Yeah, I was going to reiterate, corn is number one. And uh, since this is based on news clipping services, a lot of times they just say a person was entrapped or engulfed in grain. They don't mention uh, the type of uh, grain. But when they do mention, if I remember correctly, it's, uh, it's I think about half of all the cases we have is corn. That's the number I've seen. Yeah. Excellent. 
Well, while we wait for a couple more questions to come through, a couple um, items for housekeeping. Um, thanks again to everybody for participating today and huge thanks to Dr. Issa for being our Zoom control guru. He's been doing a great job all week. Um, we have some great questions, have had some great questions and we will um, continue. I'm seeing that we're getting a couple more. So we'll go back to those here in a couple of seconds. Um, tomorrow, we're going to learn about bin safety with great live demonstrations at the ASMARC Training Center in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, we, I'm sorry. Yes, that is tomorrow. And then Friday, we uh, will wrap up with a special presentation from Brian Bothist of OSHA on the new COVID emphasis program and guidelines. So do not miss those. You can go ahead and register for those two learning sessions at standupforgrainsafety.org. And again, I'll go over the certificates. There are two certificates. You will receive um, an email next week, most likely from the Grain Handling Safety Council with your certificates for participating in these learning sessions. So if you participated in any learning session or multiple, you will get a, a certificate from them emailed to you next week for every learning session that you participated in. You can also go to standupforgrainsafety.org and click the um, recognize your participation at the top. And that is a, a certificate that anybody can have who just wants to recognize participation in this program. You can put your name or the names of your employees as well. Last but not least, again, a huge thank you to our sponsors, um, as well as all of the partners who provide in-kind assistance to the Stand Up for Grain Safety Week. And thank you uh, for, for participating. So um, while we, I'm gonna dig up a couple. There was one more question at least. Yes, it's, I have out there, it's, uh, does a type of grain affect the rescue procedures? I, I could tell you on my end, we did a, a small scale study where we just uh, pulled out a block of wood or a mini mannequin out of, uh, we pulled out of different grains. We did soybean, we did wheat, we did canola, uh, we uh, did oat, corn, and then we also did sunflower seeds. And uh, for the most part, other than sunflower seeds, the, the amount of force required to pull the object out was similar. Uh, which tell us that the amount of uh, that the amount, at least from the rescue perspective, or what they're experiencing in grain, uh, it's actually very similar. It was a lot lower in sunflower seeds, but that's that becomes a subject for other matters. Uh, so at least, especially if you're talking about a rescue operation where they're using a green tube, removing it, that all should be very similar uh, with the vast majority of the grains, uh, at least from our study. But I'll, I'll leave it up to John and Kent if they want to elaborate more from their own experiences on that. Yeah, it does make a difference. Um, you know, the, the, the smaller grains pack tighter and the rescue tubes don't. Uh, it's harder to get them around the victims, get them down around the victims. At the training center we have in Bloomington, the Asmark uh, Training Institute, uh, have plastic pellets and they're, they pack really tightly. And it's very, very difficult to get the tubes around in, in, around the victim. Um, and we had some people there from Arkansas, and they said it's just like standing in rice. So uh, I think it makes a difference. I mean, the, the, the smaller the grain, I think the harder it is to, to get that tube around people. Mm -hmm. Dave Newcomb tomorrow would be a good one to talk. That's that one, too. Yeah, there will be some great content there. I just saw a comment that said, I'm beyond scared straight. Our intention is never to frighten you. However, uh, that's probably not necessarily a bad thing, John, right? Like you and right, right. you made me look at uh, all kinds of scenarios through different eyes um, from seeing, you know, the things that could happen. And so um, one thing that I want to mention about the certificates as well, I was just reminded, if you are watching as a group and you want learning certificates for everybody who participated in today's session or any of the other sessions, Tuesday, uh, Thursday, Friday, please drop the Grain Handling Safety Coal Coalition an email, and then we will make sure to give uh, each employee who watched a certificate with their name. Uh, and if we could go ahead and get that email address into the chat box, right on cue. Um, we will drop that to everyone. 
let's see here, it's ghscpromotions at gmail.com. So again, if you're watching as a group and would like learning session certificates emailed to you next week, please go ahead and drop that here. Gents, anything else before we close? You do have one more question. Cool. Uh, one, will the video recordings be available to the public? We think sometime next week. Um, we just need to finesse them a little bit. So we will send an email out whenever they're available. Yes, and uh, the, the question I was referring to is actually for John. Where did you guys find that video of the guy throwing the firework into the bin? That was on Twitter, believe it or not. Yeah, I got a Twitter account just so I could get that. <laughs> um, there, Salah, this might be a good one for you. Are there any specific universities developing better innovation? I lost my um, developing better innovation to promote better grain storage practices. I know the um, so that at the University of Iowa State, they are working on a, they have a, a center that's focused on grain quality. So I know one of the recent uh, efforts they did was developing a sensor that's actually not tied to a cable. So it's kind of like, um, it, it looks like a bit like a tennis ball that you just uh, throw into the grain bin. And it, it, in a sense, it flows into the grain and goes at different levels. So you throw multiple of them. And then when you're, uh, and then it will measure, uh, it will measure the, I think it was um, temperature, CO2 and other stuff. And uh, when you empty it out, it just, you basically collect the balls out because they, they won't go through. Uh, um, so that, that's one thing. And here at uh, University of Illinois, we're working as uh, John mentioned, as testing uh, air compressors and how effective they are in clearing a green bin and uh, improving upon that idea. So that's, that's another thing as well. Um, and, and and Salah, I believe it is CS Cash in Nebraska um, with the University of Nebraska. They're working with a company on a submersible um, that would, like a submarine, go under the grain and help break break up chunks and stuff. Yes, that's true. Yes, with uh, Dr. Aaron Yoder. Yes. Um, and I also believe there is another study going on, similar to what you're saying with Iowa, with um, sensors, um, uh, clothing sen sensors um, for individuals when they're entering the bin that would um, provide feedback and information. So, I mean, there is a lot of research going on. Um, Yeah. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, if you guys have any others, I know there were a couple of questions about the certificates. So again, um, really quickly, learning session certificates will be emailed next week to you. If you want your participation certificate, which is a little more general, it just says that you or your company and or employees participated this week, go to uh, standupforgrainsafety.org and click recognize your participation. We'll have you answer a few questions and then you can complete it there. Excellent, anything before we close, gentlemen? And uh, just as a note, we will be uh, like uh, sending certificates uh, for these events directly. And that's based on the attendance that we are documenting through Zoom. If you don't get a certificate, because depending on how your Zoom is set up, it might be just a generic iPhone or generic name that we can't, we can't connect it back to registration, then just contact us at our, our green handling email and we will get back to you with the certificate. Excellent. Anything else, John or Dr. Roush? Thank you both. Uh, for also being a part of the program. Great information. And um, we will hang on for a few more minutes, but everybody, thanks again for participating. This brings day three to a close. Have a great week, everybody.